Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Politics Matters podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Jakubowski, and today we have a lot to talk about between generic ballot polls, state polls, some early vote data, and more specifically where I think we're at, I guess, as a nation in terms of where I think the national environment is and where I think the general vibe of the electorate is right now. So uh, this is going to be a pretty long podcast because there's like so much to talk about because, you know, we're getting closer and closer to election day. So unsurprisingly, we have more and more stuff to be dealing with. Um, so we're just going to get right into it here. Um, let's start with the generic ballot because the generic ballot is what everyone's been talking about. And I think it's what Republicans have been using to like fully, you know, overdose on hopium with. And it's what Democrats have been either coping about or have been like just dooming about. Um, I don't really class like. I think most people have either fallen to the coping camp or the dooming camp right now. Like the doomer is like, okay, R plus five year, here we come. I've given up hope. Um, and you know, the, the cope is like, well, actually we're still into the environment. And I'm kind of like, I don't really think I'm in either of those camps. I like, I'm not dooming on the midterms, but I do think that like, it would be pretty silly to not, to like not acknowledge the movement that's happened in the past two, three months. But I'm also not like saying we're in an R plus five environment. I would actually bet against that happening. And I'm still pretty convinced that the Democrats are competitive in a lot of places I think a lot of people have given up on. So um, I want to start by saying the Republicans right now, and I'm recording this on a Saturday afternoon. And by the way, my early vote data we'll be looking at is probably be like a day delay because I can't – ideally I'd record it tonight, but I'm not going to be at my house tonight. So I'm not going to you know record a podcast at midnight just so I can get the, the Georgia early vote data. So – I'm, I'm doing this Saturday afternoon because that's the latest I can possibly do it before my Sunday morning release, right? And right now, um, obviously, we have generic ballot polls that I don't think will change in the next 12 hours, but the early vote data in Arizona and Georgia specifically is going to change. But let's – I just wanted to say that. But right now, the generic ballot on 538 is R plus 0.4. No, do not give me RCP. RCP is terrible. They have consistently missed in, their, in the direction of the Democrats for the past, like, five elections, and I have no interest in, like, caring about what they have to say. Um, they are better in terms – in presidential elections, they are better at predicting margins than 538 is. But if I want a polling aggregate and if, and if I want to actually like think for myself, I'm going to use 538. So right now, 538 has a generic, uh, generic ballot at 0.4% towards Republicans. Um, that's a fairly good guess. Again, you can play the polls underestimate Republicans game, which is true they have. I have a lot of asterisks to that this year I, and i think a lot of smart people are getting a little concerned i'm relying on that theory because like and by the way i'm not like a poll believer in 2020 i was a big biden doomer in states like texas ohio iowa even florida by the final week i was pretty sure i was going to vote for trump and so um i you know in 2020 i was able to have a better prediction because i basically knocked off the polls because the first thing I did was I applied the handicap. So basically, if, if Biden was within the margin of error in a state that you know Clinton was ahead in and Biden was leading by like less than Clinton, I basically had Trump winning it by at least three points, uh, which ended up being a fairly good, um, you know, fairly good indicator. And I had, and again, th th that is that's adjusted for polling miss per state. It's like the, the Biden would have to be up by like more in Wisconsin than he would have had to be up by in like Arizona or Georgia. Anyways, so. That's the first thing I did. The second thing that I did was I basically just chucked out half the polls because I thought they were terrible. Uh, in terms of top lines, like the Biden plus 17 Wisconsin poll was a disaster that I didn't even care about. We had a poll that had like like Trafalgar in Michigan had Trump winning Michigan while like only losing Debbie Dingell's seat by like two points. So I chucked out a lot of those polls as well. And so what happened was I basically had a forecast of a narrower than expected Biden win. Because, again, I had Biden winning 290 electoral votes. He went 306. Like, the state I missed was Georgia, but I got every other district and state right. And the reason I missed Georgia was because I, I didn't properly read the early – because, A, the polls were still kind of close, and I didn't really want to bank on it being – like because Biden was up on Georgia by, like, a point on election day of 538, and it, it ended up being accurate, but I didn't want to bank on that just yet. And also, I, I kind of misread the early vote data because the early vote data in 2020 in Georgia for Democrats had, like, the black share of the electorate lagging decently poorly. So – that's why I, I miss Georgia because I miss readily vote data and because I, I was not a poll believer. And so while that did cost me Georgia, it, it, it gave me a better than expected 2020 prediction across the board. So that's basically my preface to saying I'm not going to be a poll believer this year either. 
I don't believe the Tim Ryan polls. I don't believe the Joy Hoffmeister polls. I certainly do not believe the, the, the Lee Zeldin polls. I also don't believe the, the polls that have been showing Republicans gaining seven points since August, right? Because here's the thing. Um, this is like, I would never have admitted it at the time. And I, and like, I, I, like I, like I said this privately to a few people, uh, right. But I didn't say it in public at the time, but we were definitely in a democratic environment in August. Like, like there was no way Pat Ryan won in any Republican leaning environment. In fact, if you take his overperformance compared to Biden and just apply it, we would have been in a D plus five and a half environment, maybe D plus six environment, um, just based on that alone. And if you look at the other special elections, like the overperformance Democrats had in Minnesota and Nebraska, New York 23, and the Kansas abortion referendum in terms of primary turnout in some of those states as well, you're in like a D plus eight electorate. Now, D plus eight was unrealistic, was never, ever in play no matter what, but you were getting like, no matter what metric you used, it polls said D plus one, the Pat Ryan election said D plus six, the special said D plus eight. Like we were definitely in the democratic environment back then. If the midterms were held on like, on like the, the week after Pat Ryan won, I'm convinced Democrats probably would have like narrowly won the House. And they probably would have gotten 51, maybe 52 seats in the Senate if we got lucky in Wisconsin. OK, right. So um, that is like that, I think, is pretty true at this point. And, I, and it's kind of funny because I think a lot of Republicans have admitted like, yeah, we were so screwed back in August. But, like the thing is, they weren't admitting it at the time because like back in August, if you read the the R plus seven environment people's tweets, they were still pretty convinced it was going to be R plus seven. They just weren't, you know, they're just coping a lot, right? And they've been coping less because, like, you know, Republicans are doing better now. But the thing is, the the issue with that is that they're like they're kind of going going back to retrospect and be like, yeah, we were so screwed back then, but I didn't acknowledge it. But now I'm going to act like we're in such a better spot. But it's like you haven't changed anything. You were you were predicting a red wave back then. You're still predicting a red wave now, right? So, um. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say about the August to October swing is that it mostly – in most of the polls, it comes with independence. It doesn't come with Democrats or Republic. Like, yes, the 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 god-awful poll from, I, I, I want to say, uh, Monmouth that, that had R plus 6 was ter- – like, it, it had Republicans, like, getting an insane amount of the voters of color share – it had like 20% of Democrats voting Republicans like that poll. I, I literally do not care about, but like the other polls, like the, you know, um, Emerson R plus five, the DFP R plus three, the morning or no morning console is actually pretty good for Democrats. And, and then the NYT Siena poll that kind of kickstarted the terrible week of polls for Democrats, the R plus three likely voter uh, screen, like all of those polls just show Democrats losing ground with independent, specifically women independents. Right, because I think the NYT Siena poll showed like a double digit swing towards Republicans with women who identified as independents. And so that like is a is a sign to me that I that like that is not an indicator of a way. That's an indicator of Democrats were doing well in August, they're not doing nearly as well as, as as they were in August as they are now. Right. So um the best argument you can make for the I, I think using the polls you can make the best case you can make for Republicans is R plus four. Um the only way you could get to like an R plus six, R plus seven environment would be taking the polls and then extrapolating the 2020 polling miss to these current polls. Because like I think the generic battle in 2020 was like D plus seven and it was only ended up being D, and a, D plus three and a half, right? So you can say, oh, well, there was a three and a half point polling miss in 2020 nationwide. So if you apply the three and a half point polling miss, you get an R plus four environment. Throw in the fact that undecides are going to make Republican. Maybe you can get to the R plus seven, right? So that's like the argument for like the red wave truthers. Um and and that's the argument that I've been seeing people making on Twitter, and that is like hypo- like hypothetically true. That's the best case scenario. But the thing is, we know that's not going to happen because every single one of these polls has been showing Democrats holding their ground with their own voters, except for Monmouth, which is just a terrible. That was just a terrible poll. So like every other poll, even the bad ones for Democrats, are still showing Democrats holding their ground with their voters. And I think that like the, like the enthusiasm gap that Democrats are closing the summer is widening a little bit, but quite frankly, enthusiasm doesn't matter because if you're making an enthusiasm prediction in 2020, Trump would have won, you know, the Rust Belt and he would have won the election, right? So, um, um, like unless Democrats and like by the way, the only way to like actually measure enthusiasm is early vote ballot returns, which Democrats are beating Republicans in right now. So if you want to use the enthusiasm metric to predict an election, which I'm not advocating for, but if you do want to use that metric, you're going to get a Democratic friendly electorate if you're doing it right. So. Um, the polls are not actually making a convincing case for the red wave. What they're doing is they're making a convincing case for a swing against Democrats, which I believe, I fully believe we are in a redder environment than we were to, on, on the day Pat Ryan won, right? Like, let's say the, like, let's say we held a house election on August 23rd, which I think is the day Pat Ryan won. Okay. Say, say September, just say Labor Day, 
for the, for the sake, for just for simplicity, let's say the deduction was held on Labor, on Labor Day, September 5th, I think. Probably would have ended up D plus two and a half environment if I had to guess. Maybe D plus two. Maybe I'm a little too bullish, maybe a little too bearish. Um, I don't want to, you know, overuse the special election results, but I also want to take into account that it was a democratically environment and the polls, the same polls that are being like, that are pretty clearly overestimating Republicans were showing that at the time. So you're in a D plus two and a half environment and factor in independence swing against Democrats factor in uh, the economy getting a little worse, although again, gas prices are going down again. So that's just a rotating, um, you know. Because gas prices have been rising for the past two months, and they started going down like last week. So, um, if you want to play the gas prices game, then I guess Democrats will be doing well in a few weeks, which is when the elections held. Because again, Biden is like obviously it's you know it's a tactical move for him to release 15 million barrels of oil from our reserves, but like he's doing it clearly because of the midterms. And so, right, gas prices are coming down. Throw in the fact they were going up for the past two months. Throw in the fact that independents been swinging Republican. I think we know this for a fact. And throw in the fact that you know Republicans have just because the thing is Republicans were getting blitzed on the airwaves during the summer, like July, August. They got totally you know destroyed. They, I think that they out uh, out advertised Democrats in late September, and I think so far they've been doing so in October. I don't know how these final weeks going to go. I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be pretty even, but like objectively, especially in like states like Wisconsin and North Carolina, Republicans have been really just hammering Democrats the past few weeks. And so, you know, say all that's worth four points. That's an R plus 1.5 environment. That's not a red wave. That's like, you know, a red puddle, okay? Right? It's not particularly impressive. And it it does not, like, it is not giving Republicans a powerful mandate. That, like, R plus 1.5 is maybe enough for Republicans to, like, win... They'd probably win Nevada. Pennsylvania, I would assume they'd like narrowly lose, but I don't know. Like very, very narrowly, I think they'd lose Pennsylvania. Um and then, you know, they'd you know, they'd win the house, but like it would be like a two twenty five or like a two twenty seven to two oh eight type situation, not or may, maybe even less, maybe like a two twenty five, two twenty four seat uh, majority, which would be dysfunctional really for Republicans because you'd be putting them in a spot where they'd have to like elect a speaker and they would not like McCarthy would not have the votes to be a speaker at, at 224 seats. Um, and also like by, for all intents and purposes, it would still be like a pretty bad showing for the Republicans considering like Democrats gained 45 seats or how many seats did they gained in 2018. Okay. Yeah. They gained 41. I just had to Google it because I didn't remember the exact number, but yeah, I mean like they gained 41 seats in 2018 Republicans gained 13 in 2014, although that's because they maxed it out in 2012. And then in 2010, you know, the true red wave in the House, Republicans gained 63 seats. Okay, so that means like that like the average gain of House seats uh, in, in a midterm for the past eight midterms, like the median gain will be a 41, obviously, but like the average would be like, you know, 13 plus 63 plus 41, which is going to be something like, uh, I want to see you know, 63 plus 13, that's 76 plus 41 is going to be 117. Please tell me I did that right. Um, yeah, so 117, then, you know, divide that by three. 38 39 seats again i probably did that math wrong because i'm bad at doing math in my head while i'm talking but like you know say the say the average gain is 38 39 seats okay republicans would be looking at a situation where they'd be gaining 12 or 13 so fine decent showing i guess because like you took away the house from the democrats but like that does not inspire confidence in Kevin McCarthy. And I think Kevin McCarthy's been kind of screwed since the Dobbs decision. Cause like he because like prior to the Dobbs decision, Republicans are probably, you know, two forty seats in the House. Okay. And that would have been like an actually impressive because it would have, you know, it wouldn't be like a 33, 35 seat gain. The thing is, they don't have the ability to do that anymore because of the Dobbs decision, because it kind of restricts, you know, because like prior to the Dobbs decision, you had seats like Virginia seven, Minnesota two, Washington eight, uh, uh Maybe Connor Lane. I I wouldn't count that out yet, but like, you know, Porter and Lev. Although Levin isn't looking too good right now, but Porter especially, I, I think, right, would would have maybe been beatable, right? They had a bunch of seats or that would have been in toss up territory prior to the Dobbs decision. Those seats are now like pretty much lean D, and there's some some of them like I think especially Minnesota two is bordering on likely D. So that is like like that side of the map's gone pretty bad for republicans they've also fallen a lot in like your midwestern seats michigan's looking really good for democrats compared to where it was you know six months ago pennsylvania's looking good for democrats compared to where it was six months ago especially in that senate race although again um don't want to talk about Fetterman yet uh 
Ohio, like the fact that Republicans basically just think that they've already lost to copters pretty like tell Ryan Jakubowski from May 2022 that copter would like that the Republicans, you know, you know, wave the white flag in Ohio nine. I would have been like, uh, no, because I because like I, at that time, I probably I, I don't remember exactly what I expected, but I'm pretty sure I would have thought copter would have been more likely to get tri- triaged than J.R. Majewski. And so. Democrats have been like Democrats have like held their ground in most seats. Republicans have not, and that limits the Republican Party's ability to get a big majority in the House. Now, this is not me saying Democrats are House favorites. I, I know something to take that out of the context, but like I'm not calling Republicans House favor or uh, House underdogs by any stretch. They are clearly House favorites. Okay, um, it is like very a, uh, it is like anyone still nine like anyone still saying the House is a toss up at this point is like stuck in uh in, in August, and it's pretty clear that. Republicans are going to win the House. I mean, I shouldn't say going to because it's not a guarantee, but like, I think they have a 65, 70 percent chance of winning the House. So take, you know, just just to put it out there. Um, but McCarthy's screwed either way. So the, like Republicans, unless they have like a better than night, like a better night than I'm expecting, I think McCarthy won't be speaker. I think the House just be totally dysfunctional. And then again, that gets you back to the R plus 1.5 environment that I was talking about. It's it's not good for Republicans. Like, yes, it is a winning environment. It's not good. And it isn't like actually like a wave. It's just a red puddle, a red, you know, a red ripple maybe. So I just want to say that I'm pretty confident in like not believing in the red. Because like for me, like a red wave would be like R plus four, maybe R plus five. And I don't think those things going to happen. R plus five, my prediction in April and May, it is not my prediction anymore. And I am quite confident that um the you know the median result of this midterm is going to be closer to even than it will be to r plus five so that's my generic ballot prediction again i don't really have like i don't like i wouldn't bet on it because it because it changes every day right like there's a chance democrats retake the lead by election day it's not a prediction but i think there's a chance it happens so my generic ballot prediction i'll drop it like you know probably the day of the, I don't even know probably like the day before the election because we have so so much to talk about here um and so so much more time for the polls to move between now and election day even though it is already getting to the end of October which is kind of crazy but you know uh, elections move fast so the the one more thing I want so sorry there is one more thing I want to say about these generic ballot polls the two most recent polls, which have been from Rasmussen and YouGov, so I don't think either of those polls are great, but they're like, all right, I guess, have shown shifts towards the Democrats when all the other, like the six polls prior to those showed shifts to the Republicans. And so literally shot in the dark election. Um, I do not want to like give any super hot takes right now because I think this is like the time of like biggest uncertainty, but like clearly someone's wrong. Like either, um, like obviously, like these these generic ballot polls are all over the place. Between like you know, you go think it's a D plus three, and then you know, uh, somehow McLaughlin finding an R plus six. But like the fact that we are still in a in le- like the fact that it's this late in the game, Republicans haven't like totally had that like major surge yet. is pretty surprising. Like, yes, they've surged, but I don't think they've had like a 2014 level surge because at this point, 2014 Democrats were down by like four points, not 0.4%. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I guess I just wanted to say that now, uh, that's my generic ballot talk. That was already like 18 minutes and I don't want to talk about it anymore. Cause it's like a super weird topic. Cause again, it's just, it's like national polling and like, you know, polls suck. Although actually, Scratch that. I, I do want to t- talk about one more thing here. I guess it's kind of on the top of this, but it also relates to every single poll you'll be reading from now until election day. Um, this is a really flaming take, but like, are we sure polls aren't underestimating Republican support? Or sorry, are, are we sure polls aren't underestimating Democratic support? Because like, if I were a pollster, and and I was in like my job was on the line, I would be doing my you know, my darn best to make sure that I was oversampling Republicans that either said I said I basically guarantee that I'm not wrong in the direction of the Democrats again, because every basically every poll except for Trafalgar missed in the same direction in 2020. Right. And so I'd be oversampling Republicans that I either get, you know, a miss that favors Democrats for the first time in a while, first time in 10 years, or actually get an accurate poll by just, you know, oversampling Republicans. Right. Because like that's a that's a win-win situation. Either you miss the other way and it kind of, you know, redeems you in a way or you get it right which is even better 
And so, again, if I were a pollster, I would be massively overstating Republican support right now uh, because basically in the direction of the Democrats is like, you know, a big no-no after it's happened like the past two presidential elections after in 2020 it was so bad that like people were just like, no, I never trust the polls again. And so we are – we're in a situation where polls for like the first time ever have like an incentive to do something. And by the way, the media has been like incessantly dumeristic on Democrats. Like just even, – even in August, like the day Democrats won the New York 19 election when like NBC and all these other outlets had it like lean R or whatnot, right? The day the Democrats won that election, or the morning after, I should say, technically, they weren't talking about how, how surprising it was that Pat Ryan won. They were talking about this still means Democrats are losing the House. This still means the Senate's a toss. Like, this still means, you know, Democrats have a long way to go, right? Like, there is not ever any admission, for, or like, I shouldn't say ever, but like in 2022, there's not been any admission from the media that the Democrats were actually competitive. Because on day one, like on the whatever date you have for the day the 2020, uh, to election cycle begin. Call it March when the first primary happened. Call it the beginning of the summer, right? Whatever. Okay. The the media from that date said the House is going to go Republican, and we know this. And they have not ever admitted to being wrong on that. The media, even in even in the height of all the Democratic hopium, never admitted to it. They never ever were like, maybe the House is back in play. I know Nate Code wrote an article about it. He didn't even like. He just said, okay, well, maybe kind of Democrats with like a 1% chance of winning the House. He never, ever said anything about the House being, you know, a toss-up or even really much in play for Democrats. And nor did NBC, nor did CNN, nor did CBS. Like, all of these models that were built were built to kind of just construct a GOP-friendly aggregate that would never give Democrats a majority unless they had like a D plus 7 generic ballot. So... All the pollsters hired by these media companies like NBC specifically or CBS too, those two specifically is those ones I'm talking about, and also CNN, but I think to a lesser extent. But like CNN or CBS, NBC are the ones I'm talking about right now, okay? They have hired pollsters, right? Like CBS for or CNBC hired Heart Research and Associates, okay, which is a B plus rated pollster by 538. If they are telling them, oversample Republicans. Do it intentionally because there's a response bias. There is a bias that inherently exists in polls. The Republicans won't answer polls as much as Democrats will. We know this for a fact. And what's happening? Well, they put out an R plus two poll. Okay. You, you go CBS. It's exact same thing. R plus two poll. What about uh, Fox? They got a D plus three poll. Although, again, that was registered voters, ton of in a, a ton of undecideds. And then the um the the poll we got from CNN uh back fr from October was or back from September was only D plus B even though other polls are showing like D plus five at the time right so ultimately the most recent polls we've gotten from these media outlets have been both been R plus two and I don't even like that's not even that good because again these polls are intentionally overstating Republican support they're doing it deliberately they want to be overstating Republicans it is in their benefit to do so and they're getting R plus two polls like okay. Let's talk about the polls that are actually trying to be a bit more accurate. They're actually trying to do their own thing. Rasmussen, Republican poll, showing a shift towards Democrats. Let's talk about uh, DFP, shift towards Democrats. Survey Monkey's terrible, but they came out with a D plus two poll. So I don't know exactly how they did that, but, you know, interesting, I guess. Uh, and then most importantly, Morning Console, which I think has been like decently good this year, has a D plus three poll. And it's 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 a likely or sorry, D plus three registered vote or yeah no yeah D plus three likely voter sample from last week, so like it is fine for the Democrats right now. Clearly they've lost momentum since August. I think Republicans are on the upswing right now, but like I'm not going to do the R plus five stuff. I'm just not. It's not honest of me. It's not what I actually believe. And I and like again. A lot of people have like admitted this on Twitter, but like some people are just doing just so that they can like either do, like, do the same thing polls are doing. If they're wrong, Democrats win; they're happy. If they're right, they get to say like they're you know like they get to be like, oh wow, I was right. But here's the thing, and this is important. Okay, it is right now is the best chance to doom. Okay, so like if you're a Democrat and you're like doing with the midterms, I get that. Okay, but I don't think we're gonna have like this same. And I, and I could be like this is a prediction. It's a sixty forty prediction in my eyes. The sinking feeling in the hearts of Democrats this week 
I don't think is going to exist on November 8th. I think Democrats are going to be in a better spot on November 8th than they are going to be now. Gas prices, uh, polls, final fundraising, final ad blitz is that they're going to benefit Democrats, not by a lot, but by like maybe a point or so nationally. And that's going to matter a lot. So that's all I'm going to say generic ballot. Now, that's 25 minutes of generic ballot talk. And I qu- frankly, I'm going to like, you know, explode if I talk about this anymore because it's such a stupid conversation that has to be had. Um, and so, you know, I just, I, I just did want to say that now let's, let's talk about some of the early vote data. We'll be doing Georgia. Also, I, I want to say Florida. I said this last podcast, Florida's terrible. Like, I don't want to talk about Florida anymore. Cause like, I, it's pretty obvious that DeSantis and Ruby are going to cruise to reelection, but like, yeah, don't, don't, don't focus on Florida. If you're a Democrat, it does not matter. There are no competitive house seats. There's a Senate race that was never really competitive and anyone who said it was competitive was lying to you and it doesn't matter like that is a seat democrats do not need to have and do not really care about having quite frankly i don't think for a second chuck schumer ever thought demings had a chance so florida early vote is bad for democrats do i care no i've written i wrote florida off on on at what time was it Five thirty eastern time on november 3rd 2020 it has been out of my head i've gotten over florida like I've been over Florida for a year and a half. I am like, like I am like Georgia is the rebound state for me, right? Florida done. We're done with Florida. Georgia is our rebound state. Okay. Right. So let's just, let's do that first. Let's talk about Georgia. Okay. It's looking good. It is looking really, really good right now. Democrats right now are beating their expectations. Again, I said this a month ago, but I I, I didn't, you know, have the specific data, but a, a month ago I said that if Democrats were, at a third of the, or if black voters were at a third of the electorate prior to the weekend, like if after this, I, I don't remember the tweet, but I think I, I can try to articulate what I was thinking, but I said this back in like September. So it's hard, but like if Democrats are near a third of, the, if black voters make up nearly a third of the, or, you know, around a third of the electorate after the first week of early voting prior to Sunday, Democrats would probably win Georgia. They'd be on track to win Georgia. Right now, it's at 32.7%. This Saturday afternoon, it's probably going to go up on, uh, on, on Saturday night when I you know, will not be here to record this podcast. But, like, Democrats are right where they need to be. They aren't, you know, um, I think Lakshya said that if, if, if the black vote's still at 35% with 500,000 votes cast, uh, it's basically over for Herschel Walker. Democrats didn't hit that. There have been a total of, let me see here. 730,000 votes cast in Georgia right now, roughly 729,000 to be exact, but you know, 730k roughly. Um, and so what that is, 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 uh, that basically means that, you know, on, on the day before, right on October, today's the 20, okay. So we have, it's t- today's the 22nd. We only did it for the 21st and I'm getting it tonight, but, um, on, on, on October 20th, we had 578k votes cast, and it was, I think, 33 and a half percent black. Right? That was like to to like fully eliminate Walker in in Lockshaw's eyes, who I trust, by the way, a lot on Georgia. He had a great Senate runoff model in 2021, so he's good at this. Right? It would have had to have been a point and a half higher. So you can say, okay, well, Herschel Walker's still in it. Fine. He was a point and a half away from getting like beat in the eyes of Lockshaw three weeks before the election even started. Like it was not even. Like he was really close to getting beat. And, and the first day of early voting was 38% black. Literally the day the polls opened, black voters were massively engaged and voted and based in, you know, in 2020, I think 94% of them voted for Raphael Warnock. So that's obviously good for Warnock. Now, today is Saturday. We don't have data for Saturday yet. And I, but I wait until Sunday night. Sunday night's going to be great for Democrats. I would think. Don't want to jinx it. Cause you know, I'm, I'm fully superstitious, by the way, so I don't like like I don't say these things. Like I don't say we're going to win this. I say I think we're going to win this. If if you notice that, cool. But like, Sunday should be really good for Democrats, and I'll tell you why. The so there's a, so I actually didn't know about this till 2021, but but I think it's been happening for a while now. And so the and obviously it's been helped by Raphael Warnock being a member of the Black Church, right? But the Black Church in George in Georgia, to quote Evans Grimshaw here, because he's the Georgia guy, right? Is as much a political institution as it is a religious institution. And so there are get out the vote operations within those churches for black voters, right? So, you know, after Sunday, they, they take a bus and, and, and go early vote, right? That happened in 2021. It was what give, it was what really bailed out also off. And it's also what gave Raphael Warnock the victory over Kelly Leffler, right? And so souls to the polls, 
is really what's going to be, you know, boosting Warnock on Sunday. Because again, Sundays, it's obviously church congregation day. I, um, you know, have in the past gone to Saturday night church, but I know, I know Sunday is more common or it, it might be more common, but it, Sunday is uh, more people go to church on Sunday. Uh, and in a state like Georgia that where Democrats really like need black, vote, need black turnout, that's really important. So I think Sunday night, we should get a pretty democratic friendly drop of early votes. Uh, obviously mostly because they, the black trivia electorate will spike. And so we could be looking at like a 33 and a half, 34% electorate uh, or uh, black electorate after Sunday. And most importantly, if we do get to 35% of the vote being black with uh, being black on Sunday night, we'd probably be at like, I, this is just some quick math here because the vote increased it, it, it from October 20th to October 21st, the vote increased by five seven you know it it increased by 150,000 roughly right or um am, am i doing my math right there yeah so, uh, like you know 100 uh, 160,000 okay so let's say the votes let's say we get just for simplicity 350,000 more votes cuz i think well actually no probably 400k cuz we can turn out higher than weekday turnout cuz people aren't at work right let, let 400k votes okay would be over a million and if we get anywhere near like like if we're at 34.5 or even better, 35% or even you know, 35 point something percent of the of the electorate being black, Walk, Walker basically is dead at that point. He cannot afford to have this electorate get any blacker. Right now, like right now, it's already pretty good for Warnock. Like right now, he's at where he should be at if he wants to win. We're at like, you know, we're at a point in which Walker is close to getting eliminated, right? Like he is in he is in a He's in game six, down three to two, and, and he's losing by, you know, six or five or six points with five minutes to go, right? Like he needs, you know, to either have a great E-Day turnout, which he might get, or easier, hope the black voters don't turn out as, as much as they've been turning out this first, first week in early voting. So again, Georgia early vote looks really good for Democrats. I don't know why people think it looks bad for Democrats, because like someone said it looked bad for Democrats, but like the consensus among obviously myself and other people who are smarter than me is that it's, it's good for Democrats. And also just like look at the data for yourself. Democrats are outpacing their 2020, like obviously 2021 was a good year for Democrats in Georgia because they won the runoffs and they're outpacing their numbers um, in 2021, right? So they're already like running a point ahead of where they would be in 2021. And also more importantly, a lot of people think the early votes can be less polarized uh, than it was in the last election because of COVID obviously. And so- when you get that, it means that the election day vote could be a lot more bl- uh, could be a lot more black leaning than we might be expecting. So, um, you know, maybe there are some outstanding votes, uh, or maybe there is a higher percentage of black voters waiting till election day to vote that we don't know about. It, you know, that's something that's possible. I, 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 it's not like a super confident prediction that I have, but I think it's be higher than t- it was the day that Warnock and Ossoff won. Um, and and also, you know, for what it's worth, even then it beat expectations because like like the expectation was that if there were I don't know like, I don't remember the exact number I'm not like I know the exact number but like I remember because I remember January fifth very well because it was a very you know scary day for me um, because I was you know I, I was on Twitter basically all day I was distracted I was not able to focus but like you know what we saw was that like someone made a meme the day before the the election okay right and so it was basically you know or sorry. The, the day of the election it was like purdue was like you know praying for high election you know it was like he, purdue meets a genie he wish he, he gets one wish what do you wish for purdue and it's like i wish for high election day turnout from the state of georgia okay and then the joke was that the high turnout came but it, it, a lot of it came from decab and fulton counties which were massively um pro warnock because they were you know city of atlanta a ton of black voters they're backing warnock and ossoff and so that is why we got a very pro democratic vote in the atlanta area even on election day and like people were not like did the election day vote exceeded expectations in georgia like tell me that 24 hours before it happened i would have said left on purdue would have won but because a lot of black voters actually waited till election till election day to cast their votes it didn't matter and the democrats ended up winning so i think we're going to see a similar thing this year but the thing is different about this year is that democrats are actually beating their 2021 numbers so like if you want to do that extrapolation They'd be winning by like three and a half, four points right now. And again, Sunday hasn't even come yet. Sunday should be the best day for Democrats every day of the week. So Sunday, what I think we're going to see is Democrats going to boost their black share of the electorate by at least half a point. So let's say it's at 32% on uh, uh, on tonight, right? Like it'll probably fall by another half point, point, and a half point. 
well, let's say it's that, you know, 31.932%, it should go up back to where it is right now. And if it's at like 34%, it is over or it is borderline over for Walker. If, if it's at 35%, it is really over for Walker. So that's Georgia. Let's do uh, Arizona now, because I think Arizona is also pretty interesting. Arizona looks like mixed, I think, for Democrats. I would lean it. I would lean towards saying it looks good. Um, but the data we have from the most recent day, which I think was Friday, we saw Democrats having a higher return rate than Republicans. Um, Democrats right now have about a 14,000 uh, vote lead. Again, that's part of, that's based on registration model data. It doesn't mean Kelly or Hobbs up by 14K. It means just party registration, which probably helps Democrats because, again, um, there are more registered Republicans in the suburbs that vote Democrat in Arizona than there are, you know, working class registered Democrats vote Republicans. So um, Arizona looking like decent for Democrats. It isn't like amazing like Georgia is, but it looks pretty good right now, I would say. Um, and also Democrats are in terms of ballot return rate. It's, it's better because Democrats have 8.3 percent ballot return rate. Republicans have 6.5 percent ballot return rate. So, um, yeah, uh, Democrats seem to have the early advantage in Arizona poop just based on ballot return rate. So that looks uh, pretty good for the Democrats in Arizona. Um, now, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is also, is, I think, the second best state for Democrats to really vote behind Georgia. Um, so again, Pennsylvania has been updating their votes very sporadically. We last have an update from the 21st. And right now, Dem- so again, this might change in the next 12 hours. I don't know. I'm hoping it doesn't, so this is as up-to-date as possible. But right now, Democrats make up 73.1% of ballots returned, so they are doing pretty well. Um, Democrats have a 40% return rate on mail-in ballots, which is, by the way, really good because we are only like a, a week and a half into Pennsylvania early voting, and we already have 40% of our voters having turned in the ballots they requested. Republicans are doing pretty well as well. They're at 37%, but Democrats have a higher return rate than Republicans, which is pretty good, especially, and that's also good because D- Democrats requested 895K ballots, Republicans only requested 250K. So like having a higher return rate, even though you have a lot more ballots is still pretty impressive. So I'm going to say Democrats are looking pretty good in Pennsylvania right now. Again, uh, the the statistics in terms, in terms of age, like on the surface look bad for Democrats, but again, 65 plus tends to usually vote um very like very um early mail and heavy and a lot of the 60 like basically every person of the age of 65 who's a democrat will vote early so just you know i just wanted to put that out there and then if you look at the county data democrats are punching above their weight in allegheny they're punching above their weight in chester in delaware in uh dolphin so i would say pennsylvania is looking quite good right now again Early, like Pennsylvania early vote was very lopsided as well in 2020. So Democrats are like only tracking like a little better than they were in 2020. So again, using extrapolation, I think that would be like a Fetterman plus two and a half Fetterman plus three type victory. I'm not predicting that right now for the record, but that's where I think you would be at um, at this point. So yeah, that is Pennsylvania. Now, finally, finally, let's talk about Michigan. So Michigan right now, the counties with the, the, the big counties, with the highest return rates, uh, are at least Democratic leaning. The first and most important is Washtenaw County, which is where Umich is. Half of ballots have already been returned yet, so that's great for Democrats because, again, that's like the most liberal county in all of Michigan. Um, Leland County, which voted for Biden, is a left-trending county. You already have 49.7% of ballots turned in from there. Oakland County, which is, again, the big 1.2 million people suburban county that was like Biden plus 20, very important to the Democratic coalition in Michigan. 45% of ballots re- returned. And then most of the rural counties in like the you know deep red uh, areas, to kind of just smaller, they are all in the mid range. They're at you know mid low to mid thirties. And then the counties are like severely lagging behind. Every single county that's lot that's below thirty percent of ballots returned, all Republican counties. A few in the Upper Peninsula, a few in the middle of the state. None of these counties were even close. They're all Republican counties. So Democrats are doing well in their counties. Republicans are doing kind of well in some of their counties, but like. The only counties that like like actually like, like going you know sicko mode in terms of returning their ballots right now are um, obviously Lee Lanau, Oakland, and uh, Washtenaw. So that's really good for Michigan Democrats. Um, I think right now they like where they're at. I know the Michigan people on Twitter seem to be pretty satisfied with where the Democrats are at in Michigan right now. So that's pretty good. And then finally, um, I do want to talk about some state Senate or some Senate some Senate polling averages. So. As you guys know, I built my polling average 
uh, a month and a half ago. It's been pretty good. It, it is showing kind of the same trajectory as the other races. Democrats have, uh, you know, their leads in most of these states have either evaporated or have narrowed. Like, for example, um, in Ohio, I think the day I built it, Ryan was up by two. My aggregate had him down by half a point. He's now down by over three. So that's just an example of where, again, this is at. Now, again, this is not a prediction. This is not me saying, oh, well, um, I think, you know, I think X is going to happen by X percent. What I am saying is this is what the polling aggregate's at. And this, by the way, this polling aggregate was pretty good in 2020. They got 49 out of 50 states right. Again, this is not my actual 2020 prediction. Um, but this prediction would have had Biden winning every state he ended up winning plus North Carolina. So, it you know, it overestimated Biden a bit, but North Carolina, not uh, awful. And the thing it did well is that is is and I tested it out, you know, just to see if it's actually good, is that it, it predicted, like the, the, like the model did, did not buy the polling in Ohio, did not buy it in Texas, did not buy it in Iowa, did not buy it in Florida either. And so it was able to kind of like weed out the bad Democratic leaning polls. And so I'm just basically just chucking out all, you know, all the center street polls, all the echelon polls. Um, but I'm keeping in the Republican internal because, again, this is a poll meant to overstate Republican support because polls tend to, over, to under, have, under, have underestimated them in the past. So let's talk about what the polls showing because, again, this is a this is like a bit better than RCP. It's it's still pretty RCP like, but it, it's a bit better, I guess you could say. So let's talk about our uh, but where this uh, is at right now. So starting with Arizona, Mark Kelly up by four point four percent. Again, this is factoring Trafalgar, factoring in WIC, factoring in coefficient insider advantage on message because a bunch of Republican pollsters pulled Arizona the past two weeks. Kelly's still up by four and a half, looking pretty good for him. Colorado, Michael Bennett up by 6.5 for Joe O'Day. No surprise there. Florida, Val Deming's down by 4.6%, and she'll probably lose by a lot more, but the polls have had it kind of close. There's not really much you can do with that. Georgia, uh, aggregate thinks Warnock's up by two. I think that's a pretty good assessment of where the race is at right now. Might be a little too bullish on Walker, but, you know, Warnock plus two is very, very feasible. And then the only state where the polling aggregate thinks the Democrats are actually going to do better than they are doing right now is Nevada, where um, 538 has Cortez Mastro down by one. My average has her up by literally 0.6. So that mostly comes from the fact that we haven't had like a ton of Nevada polls compared to like Arizona, Georgia, or Pennsylvania. And we've also had historical polling misses in Nevada that have actually benefited Democrats. So that's part one. Part two is that a bunch of Republican polls have polled uh, Nevada, and they aren't really great for lack salt like Trafalgar inside advantage only have him up by three and four percent and um you know Suffolk has him down so you know Cortez Mosh I think is an underdog right now but he's still in it um New Hampshire obviously Hassan's up by over five points no surprise there North Carolina Ted Budd is leading in my aggregate by three and he's gating looking pretty bad for Sherry Beasley right now um unfortunately because she's one of my fair candidates but I don't think she's gonna pull it out um Ohio Tim Ryan down you know in free fall he's now down by over three percent Pennsylvania, John Fetterman is actually, you know, holding up decently well again, because here's the thing, 538 does not adjust their polls as much as I do. So for example, the WIC poll that showed Oz leading his first, guys, let's clap for, you know, Dr. Oz finally led a poll. What can I say? It's been, you know, five months since he got the nomination. He finally led a poll. He did it, guys. Safe Republican. Am I right? He led by four and a half in the poll that had Trump winning Pennsylvania. This is also the poll that thinks Tudor Dixon is winning Michigan. This is the poll that thinks that the uh that the new york the new york governor race is competitive and so i don't really love them to be honest with you but i threw them in the aggregate because you know don't want to be consistent here by the way i i, I do keep all the republican internal polls in most democrats internal internal polls get taken out just for the record but when adjusted it's a it's an r plus 2.8 poll so that goes in the aggregate you still get <coughs> excuse me you still get a lead for fetterman of 4.2 percent so he's up by a good amount in this Republican leading aggregate. So I think Fetterman plus 4.2 outpacing where he would have been because, because like my final Pennsylvania um, prediction using this aggregate would have been Biden plus 2.4. So Fetterman would be running 1.8% ahead of Biden in this aggregate, which I think is a pretty good sign for him. Although again, it's still going to be close. Then in Wisconsin, no surprise there. Mandela Barnes losing by four points. Uh, that race is basically over at this point. So yeah, um, that gets you to a 51-49 Senate in favor of the Democrats. They'd be winning Arizona, Nevada, Georgia. They would be flipping Pennsylvania, but they'd be coming short in North Carolina, Ohio, and Wisconsin. So that's not my prediction. That's what the polling aggregate says, and I think it's a pretty good like it's a pretty good representation of where we are if you use the polls. So um, I just wanted to say that to wrap up this podcast because I think like a lot of people have like gone into like free fall dooming about um, the elections. And by the way, I actually have a rant about this because I do think it's important for everyone to say – Forever for everyone to hear. Um, if not for me, take it from someone else. But this is my the point I'm trying to make here. 
Um, stop dooming. There is a difference between, like, making a prediction that doesn't benefit your party. Like, people call me, like, a doomer on, like, Tim Ryan or a doomer on Tina Kotek, okay? Um, there's that and going into, like, emotional freefall and being like, oh, well, it's all over. Democrats are going to lose, right? And so, stop, stop, like, literally stop dooming. Um, it is, it's bad in a sense that, like, it, it's not grounded in data, but, like, it also is, like, just outright lie like saying oh we've had a few republican internal polls showing you know good results for republicans therefore they're now going to be winning the new hampshire senate race is like completely grounded in nothingness the sudden like like a vibe shift towards dr oz in pennsylvania don't know where that came from he led in a poll a poll that literally disguised its name and had trump winning pennsylvania by you know over two percent in 2020 and so look this might be a good year for Republicans. I'm not. Pretty, I'm, I'm not even saying it's not going to be, but like the obsession with like being like, oh well, I'm I'm just going to make myself feel miserable for the next few weeks that maybe Democrats will slightly exceed my expectations and I'll be happy. But it's just like, you know, that's that's not what I'm going to do. For me, like people on Twitter are free to do as they please, but for me, what I'm trying to do here, and again, this is my, you know, this is like not really my job. Like it, it's it's what I'm trying to do here with this podcast, YouTube, Substack, right? Is to give the best information I can give. And I'm not going to let my personal opinions affect that. So like, I'm like, I'm not going to let my, you know, me trying to doom on, on purpose, just ruin my predictions. Right. Because unlike the pollsters, I don't want to be wrong in the direction of the Republicans just as much as I don't want to be wrong in the directions of the Democrats. So that's where I stand right now. That's going to wrap up this podcast. This is the longest solo podcast I think I've ever done, but it was worth it. There's a lot to cover. So thank you for listening. If you enjoyed, please hit that like button. If you're on YouTube, obviously, please subscribe if you're on YouTube. Um, tweet at me. I'm at Ryan Jakubowski. Go follow me there. Uh, you can go follow my YouTube channel. It's Unbiased Election Predictions if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, if you're on that. Um, and then finally, and most importantly, read my writing at uepyt.substack.com. I'm publishing articles there. So I've got some important stuff going on as we lead up to the midterm. So um, always appreciate the listening, and I'll see you on Thursday. Have a good few days.